Okay, so the, the next piece we'd like to do is to look at the types sort of from a high level archetypal perspective. There is an in inner logic to the Enneagram. And if you look at Michael Goldberg's work um, on, what is it, the Odyssey, uh, you can really see that the archetypes of the Enneagram are not just a modern day psychological invention, but they actually have been around you know, as far back as we can find in written history. So to, one of the ways to see that is to simply look at, uh, if we go around um, the, the Enneagram, is to see sort of the logic in terms of why the types are arranged where they are, which is what I'm, I'm going to do here very briefly, but it's, I find it quite fascinating. If we look at the nine as being sort of the undifferentiated essence. And from a spiritual perspective, this would be an unconscious merged state with the divine. It's really this, the energy of before I have individuated out and established my own preferences. So this is both the beginning and the end, which is why it's right at the top. So from an archetypal, archetypal perspective, this can be the baby in the womb, it's, it's merged with its environment. It's not experiencing an I-thou relationship. And that's what we see with nines, is that nines fuzz out their boundaries almost to a level where they're having trouble distinguishing that you're different people, that you have different preferences. And in particular, what nines do is they go to sleep to their own preferences to maintain this stance. Um, we sometimes can see this with nines, they'll call it the false Buddha syndrome, where if you're in a spiritual community, what we'll often see is that nines will become elevated as being more spiritual than other people because they appear to be less ego oriented than the other types. The reality is their ego message is don't have preferences. <laughs> so it's a mimic of a higher spiritual state. And healthy nines like, like the Dalai Lama uh, would actually have released a good deal of that. And what's interesting is that when the nine actually starts to release some of the ego dictates, they actually start to show up in the world more. So it's sort of paradoxical. But the nine state, it, the way to think about it is sort of that baby in the womb. And after someone has gone on the, the journey all the way through, this sort of journey of consciousness or evolution or psychological development, uh, which we see Campbell you know, talks a lot about, um, when they come back to the nine, at the very end, instead of being the unconscious baby in the womb, it would be the aware spiritual seeker who is both aware of their individuality and also aware that they are truly one with um, a, a power much greater than themselves. But the starting position here is really a one of unconsciousness, which is what we see in the lower aspects of nine, right? It's just sort of a, a like there's sort of a blanket over them. Um, the first impulse out, out of Godhead or out of into individuation or from a, a you know, what's so interesting is that when you look at things psychologically or metaphysically, everything becomes like a hologram and it doesn't matter whether I'm talking about uh, you know, psychological development from birth, or we're talking about spiritual principles, they all reflect each other pretty quickly. Um, but this first impulse out is the masculine impulse out of individuation, out of whether that you can look at that as being born and establishing a personality, or simply out of, you know, the son of God. And of course, the one is the father energy. And what kind of energy is it? It's a moral energy. And where does that moral sense come from? It's really coming from a reflection of what God's values are. So the one sees themselves as right and good. Well, what is that? That's someone who's trying to express godliness, goodliness in life. So the one really is the father figure on the Enneagram. And boy, we sure see a lot of them in politics. You know, Kerry, Gore, McCain, uh, Hillary Clinton, they're all ones. OK, so we're going from the father energy here to the mother energy. So with the two, we really see someone who approaches the world as the mother. I am the giver. I am the one who has the milk to provide. Um, and the healthy two can see what other people need, particularly emotionally, and to provide it for them. So we have sort of this you know, union with God. The first impulse out is the father, then the mother. So what do we think the three is? Well, the three is the firstborn child. And the best way to get your head around this is if you think about a firstborn child, um, actually any children, um, always wanting the parent to give them positive feedback for anything that they do. So you think of a kid who learns how to swim and they're going to jump off the diving board 
and they say and they won't jump until they get the parents attention you know the energy of the one and the two for the praise and the admiration and then as soon as they get that oh good job you know great dive what do they do they do it again right and then what happens they do it again and they'll do it 50 times in a row well this is where the three is okay the three is looking externally for affirmation that what they're doing is of value and is someone who's successful and that affirmation archetypally is coming from kind of it's external whereas the one it looks internally to see well where is my moral judgment coming from the three is really looking externally to want to be perfect in your eyes whereas the one kind of wants to be perfect in their own eyes the ones and threes can kind of be confusing sometimes because they're both perfectionistic but the one is more the moral perfectionist and the three is more wants to be the perfect person so us poor fours what are we well, we're the second born child right so that's the energy of the second born child who can't, always feels that they can't quite measure up to what the threes and this is what we so what the four does is if they can't be seen as a successful firstborn that's sort of elevated in the family system it becomes the energy of how do i be special unique different um, and they also often carry the shame energy of the family and also of the culture or the group or the corporation that they're in. So the four often sort of is more in touch with sort of the dark side or the disowned part of the system that they're in, whereas the three is sort of trying to be the perfect example of the perfect person in the system that they're in, if that makes any sense. So this person is trying to look like the successful person and the four is kind of trying to stand out and be different to get the attention, but they're also uh, is still aware of maybe where mom and dad aren't such great parents or where maybe there's a problem that's going on. So as we move from the four energy, what we have here on the right side of the Enneagram really is the, is the kind of the nuclear family. It's that family structure. The five energy is the first impulse out towards the peer group. So the orientation goes away from looking at the parents archetypally to what are my peers doing? And what is the hierarchy within my peer group? Now the five is mostly wanting to observe this from afar because they aren't quite sure of where they would fit in or their the self-confidence to go in and participate but the orientation has moved away from I want the admiration of the parent figure to I, my focus is on the, the peer group right so we see this in, in you know grade school when siblings kids start and siblings so the head triad is all about siblings and peer energy and the five also is the type that understands the hierarchy within that and wants to be at the top of that hierarchy, particularly intellectually, or the knowledge holder, kind of the shamanistic kind of energy.